Thank you, Gary, for joining us. Uh, Gary is our special guest for today, just right after the Tesla Q3. And uh, really, there's a big miss, and we think it's the big miss is from the investment analysts, Gary. So we're going to have to ask you about that. But Gary Black, many of us know who he is, but uh, for those who don't, he's a managing partner. He's a co-founder of the Future Fund. This is a he's an investment advisory firm that they they focus on growth equities. So his background's very impressive, Gary. I've always liked to tell folks because few actually tell anybody what your background is. And you've been 30 years at this. You've been the CEO at Aegon. You oversaw $120 billion in assets there. You're a CEO at Black Capital, at Janus Capital Group. You were CIO at Goldman Sachs as well. So check out his website at The Future Fund, and he's got some ETFs there. So Gary, welcome joining us. We really do appreciate you here. Thanks. Appreciate being here. Wonderful. First question we want to ask you, as always, is, you know, the investment analysts' estimates for Q3 were way off. But weirdly, they were much higher than the retail analysts and also much higher than what actually happened. So they were, I think, consensus was 454,000. And, of course, the actual delivery was 435. Fortunately, nothing happened to the stock. It didn't go down. It was kind of built in. You were already telling folks that was the case. So why don't you give us a, a roundup of your thoughts of what happened with Q3? Okay. Well, just remember, there's a difference between the sell side and the buy side. You can't see what the buy side. The buy side is Fidelity, T. Rowe, Capital, ourselves, you know, people who are actually buying stocks. The sell side, they're brokers. You know, they put out estimates. They get paid through commissions. I always got to remember they're, they're salespeople. They build models and everything, but their job is to basically make money and get people on the buy side like me to pay them commissions. So they're more of a marketing type thing, but that's when you see, when they say the consensus, that's the sell side. Buy side, you have no idea what it is. And I think, and the buy side is what controls the stock though. That's the hedge fund community. And again, the big long only shops. And I think most people on the buy side, at least I talk to, we're using numbers much lower than 455. You know, they were kind of in the 440, 445 range because like yourselves and a lot of people on retail, they could see that the China numbers, there were no Model 3s to sell. They took to heart that, you know, there were going to be plant shutdowns to upgrade the lines, you know, both for Cybertruck, for Model 3 refresh. So I think most people on the buy side were kind of in the 440, 445 range. And that's why when the number came out at 435, it was that big a shock and, you know, it was down initially, but then as you said, it came all the way back. So I think the bigger issue is going to be, okay, how bad are the margins going to get hit in the third quarter? I think the street, again, the street being the sell side, because that's what you can see is about 18, 18, two. I'm at about 17. I think most of the people on the buy side are 17. So I'll be very interested to see in a couple of weeks when they report third quarter earnings, where are the margins and what kind of guidance do they give, if any, for the rest of the year and have gross margins actually bottomed. And it's really going to come down to whether Elon still thinks he should be taking pricing down. As most people who follow me know, I'm not a big fan of cutting price on existing models. And if, if they're going to be taking prices down further, gross margins could sink further. And that would be bad for the stock if they had guided to lower gross margins. Remember Zach in the first quarter, or maybe it was fourth quarter last year said, Gross margins, X red credits of 20 is kind of where we think the bottom is. And in the second quarter, they got down to 18. I think they'll be 17 in the third quarter. And really what's going to drive the stock going forward is what kind of signal they give for gross margin going forward, because that's going to signal whether or not Elon still wants to take prices down further. So I'll stop there and shut up. I <laughs> know we don't want you to shut up. We want you to keep talking, Gary. The, you're yeah. the special guest today. So each one of us have some, we're going to ask you some questions. We have lots of good questions to ask you, but you know, this may not be the best question to ask, but um, last week we had Gordon Johnson with us. It was a very fiery kind of fun debate, but you know, you know, you're a person who always says that um, you like to talk to bears and you gave a list of these bears that we should talk to, but Gosh, Gary, some of these people, they're just not even in reality. I really don't think that he's a kind of like a like somebody who really is debating with credibility. It's more of an agenda there. I mean, he basically said that EVs are a niche. He said a number of things that are just way off base. But I wouldn't listen to Gordon. Gordon yeah. is, like you said, he's a sensationalist. He doesn't have a job. He runs oh. his own firm. I don't think he has a lot of clients that pay him, to be honest with you. 
if you're going to listen to a bear, I will listen to Tony uh, Saganaki, who I used to work with yeah. at Bernstein. He's a credible bear, and a lot of people pay him money. He makes, you know, toward the high end of the street in terms of analyst comp. I mean, he's and he has models for everything. He's not just throwing shit up on the wall and, you know, hoping to be sensational. He actually has analytical models to base what he says. And his view is that, you know, Tesla has a lot of competition coming in more so than they've ever had. And, it, you know, and he does things the way I do. He tries to come up with an EV adoption rate. He multiplies the times an EV share, and that's the way he comes up with his volumes. And his investment thesis is that as new competition comes in, and as Ford and GM and everybody else spend a lot of money on EVs, Tesla's going to lose its EV share. And as a result of that, they're not going to be able to make their, their you know, what analysts are thinking are going to be the forecast for volumes or for earnings going forward. No, I disagree with that, but that is, I wouldn't, I don't even know why you'd pay attention to him. It's just, he's not credible. He doesn't have a client base. Yeah. Thank you. Gary. My view. Yeah. So let's go down the, the, the panel here. Each person can ask a question just to get everybody to be aware. You are a bull and uh, your price target yep. for Tesla is $320 in the next six to 12 months. You regularly post what you think are the upcoming catalysts, which we can go through later. But why don't we start with you, Jeff? You gave me a list of questions that you would like to ask him. Why don't you start with the one that you would like to ask him most? Thanks for joining, Gary. I, yeah. And one of the questions I had was just around, if you look at the Magnificent Seven, which one do you believe has the you know highest rate of return from here on out? Risk adjusted, yeah. Yeah, so our number one position is Google. And, you know, we think about Google as probably having at least four to one upside to downside. You know, it is still an AI play as they build Bard into, you know, their search engine. And, you know, it's got YouTube, obviously, as advertising continues to rebound, for lack of a better word. It doesn't have any drama. It's a very, you know, on a risk adjusted basis, you know, you, you don't have a high beta. So, we think, you know, the, the, the only thing negative you could say about Google is they already own 90% of the search business, which is the cash cow. So they don't have a huge upside, but they don't have a lot of downside either. It trades at about 18 times next year's earnings, which is about where the S&P trades. But it's got, you know, probably 12 to 13% growth. So, you know, we try to look at things from a price earnings relative to growth basis. It still looks pretty reasonable to us. I think Tesla... You know, look, if, if I had 100% conviction that they weren't going to cut price, I would probably, you know, convince my partner, Dave Kalis, that we should be taking Tesla up to the number one position. But I'm not convinced of that. Elon has shown this stubbornness that, and, it, it, and to me, it's like a, a marketing toolkit. He's got a marketing toolkit of stuff to increase volumes. And whenever he gets stuck or whenever inventories get too high, he relies on price. And I use this as an analogy. It's kind of like a guy, he's in a, you know, rut with his wife. And every time he has a fight with her, he buys her flowers. Well, there's a lot of things you can do to make your wife, you know, happy with you. But if you're always buying flowers, after a while, that becomes old. And unfortunately, with pricing, and I know, you know Alexander's probably giving me a hard time for that analogy. But <laughs> with pricing, it's like a very blunt weapon that, you know, it's not that sophisticated to cut price. And you're basically training consumers to wait. So my problem with Tesla is not that it doesn't have great funnels. It's got huge upside. You know, the EV adoption in the U.S. is only, you know, about 8%. Globally, it's, you know, let's call it 15. And so you got all the way to 100% to go. But my worry is they use pricing as their weapon whenever inventories get high relative to orders. And that's not good for the stock because it's a permanent value reduction whenever, you know, whenever they cut price. And they just cut price on SNX, as you know, mid-August. You got no volume increase as a result of it. You would think they would look at that and say, okay, price and elasticity on least in SNX is pretty low. So let's not do that anymore. But I don't have conviction that they've learned from their mistakes when they cut price. So that's why we don't put it as our number one position. I really like Tesla. I think EV adoption is going to continue to grow very rapidly. I think Tesla, as they go into um, pickup trucks, which is a TAM they're not in, as they go into the under, the, you know, it's called thirty thousand dollars segment, which is a TAM they're not in, as FSD gets to be level four and higher, those are all big positives. But this pricing issue just kind of hangs out there, and it makes me nervous that if they cut price, especially on Model Y, 
that's bad for the stock. So that's why I don't put it as number one. So Google's number one, Tesla's number two. Gotcha. I quick a fo- couple quick follow ups on that. One, one is on the SNX really quick. I know it's only like four percent of their sales, and I actually. I took advantage of FSD transfer and I, I was basically the week before they did the price cuts. So, and then I just for shits, I ordered, I bought an X. I've just for shits. I actually ordered an S and I, and I, I was trying to see what kind of trading I was going to get. And I, right when they did the price cuts, I ordered it, you know, I'm in the Midwest and I couldn't get a delivery date before October 5th to 12th. So I think some of that, you know, the, the point in time in the quarter when they did the SNX price change may have something to do with how much uptake they're actually, they were actually able to fulfill in the quarter. I know they drew down on, on a bunch of the inventory and then just more on the pricing front. I think this move with the model Y yesterday, this was a move to uh, introduce a new purposely built product with, you know, that removed cogs from the product you know, purposely removed cogs and features and, and they priced it lower than, than the next model up. So to me, like that was the move on the Y and the move on the three has already happened where they're just going to basically get rid of inventory in North America and they've introduced the new three plus a- abroad. So I think they've made the moves on the th- three and Y and they did the two Y trims in September in China, the two lower trims. So when I look at it from a pricing perspective, they haven't made a meaningful configurator move, you know, on the three and Y, which is 95% of the volume since April. And so I think they're largely done. And this is kind of, to me, the move they did yesterday on the Y and then the, the introduction of the new three tell me they're largely done with those moves. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Gary, I muted you. Sorry, please. Unmute yourself. Yeah, I agree with that. If you, if you were to say, what is the best thing they could do on Model Y? It's exactly that because they got rid of the all wheel drive, we'll call it standard range, which was priced, I think, at 47.9 or so a couple weeks back. And now they have this 43.9 rear wheel drive, very slow, zero to 60 in 6.6 seconds. That's slow in my book. But, you know, it's a way of getting people, you know, we, we used to call them flanker products when I was in brand management. And years ago, I worked at J&J in the Tylenol business, and we were always fighting generics. And you want to have a flanker product that you can put out there to get people's attention. And 43.9 is, for an SUV, is a flanker product. So you're bringing people into the franchise. And if they don't like that it's 0 to 60 and 6.6, they can buy a Model Y long range at, you know, 5490 so I think that's a smart stretch because they're not cutting price on Model Y effectively. They're basically bringing out another trim, which is fine. And that's not going to, I don't think that's going to cannibalize long range Model Y or performance Model Y. I just don't. I think it's going to be a different a different segment of people who go in and buy a 0 to 60 in 6.6 6 seconds, which is 260 miles of range than who would ordinarily buy a Model Y long range. So I'm fine with that. I don't consider that a price cut. I just consider that a flanker product, which, you know, if you look at Model 3, they have a rear wheel drive, same thing. It's priced a lot lower than the long range. And so I think that's very smart. And to your point, when Model 3 comes to the U.S., and I believe it's going to come in the fourth quarter, I don't think they're going to wait till first quarter because people are smart. They get on the internet. And if they see that there's a new Model 3 coming, but they can't buy it till January, then they're not going to sell any Model 3s in the fourth quarter. And I don't think Tesla's that stupid. I think they're going to bring it out as soon as they can, and you're going to see it in the fourth quarter. And that'll be good because you'll get, you know, this new product, essentially, that looks like a Model S. It's a better product. And I think that plus Cybertruck, because Cybertruck should be out, let's call it by November. I've been saying fourth quarter all along, so I'm not sure where... The Wall Street Journal said it was going to happen in the third quarter, and that was a big to-do when it didn't happen. You know, and I know maybe Elon, you know, suggested maybe it would hit in the third quarter, but I've always thought it was going to be the fourth quarter. So when you get Cybertruck and you get it rolling around and everybody's watching it and saying, wow, that's pretty cool, or I really hate it, but at least it gets people's interest, and you get a new Model 3, which is their entry-level car, I think it sparks interest in the entire Tesla franchise 
So I'm very optimistic the fourth quarter is going to be north of 500,000 units. That's the bottom line. And the street right now, you know, it, it's hard to know. I, I didn't look this morning when I got in, you know, how they changed fourth quarter number. I think the street's at about 495, let's call it, for fourth quarter. But I think you could be north of 500, and that'll be positive for the stock. Okay, thank you. So let's have Christian come up with his question. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Thanks for joining us. Well, wonderful conversation so far. So my, uh, my question is more of a broad question. I love you on your numbers. You're, you're very detail-oriented. It's a li- little bit different than the way I do it. I, I do more napkin math. And I think as you get out like three, five, and even seven years, like 2030 or something, 2031, it becomes harder to kind of do these discounted cash flows back. The way I thought of Tesla originally and I want to get your – this is like what I want to like really get your point on. For Tesla to be like your number one position or right now it's your number two or number three and to believe in the stock like you do, you base pretty much everything on cards. I've kind of reversed my thinking on that. I don't think it's possible. I mean it's possible, but I don't think that's the story anymore with Tesla. I think Tesla – and you don't really buy into this, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think you have to start to implement – and I think – the Wall, Wall Street is, and, and investors are, either an FSD scenario or a Tesla bot scenario in the future, which is going to drive tremendous value. Because if you do it on cars alone, and, and you talked about Elon, and I think you're right, Elon is not driving profit in the automobile business. He's driving units, and he's taking margins down. So I think if that's your thesis long term, that's going to be a hard thesis to get a one and a half, two trillion, three trillion dollar valuation on that because they're going down. And I don't know in this interest rate environment, if it stays like this for years, that it's going to get much better. I agree in a zero interest rate environment, it would have been possible. So I'll just I'll sum it up here and I'll get your opinion. Okay. so if you did 10 million cars, Gary, 10 million, which is far down the road. Yep. And Elon's driving price down and you're you're bullish on the model, too, which I am, too. But that's going to be a lower price car with lower margins. So let's just do a general math problem and say, okay, 40 million cars, I mean, 10 million cars times $40,000 unit price. And we give a 10% bottom line. Let's be generous. 10% net profit. You you know, you're going to make $40 billion. And, you know, at that point, you're pretty much exhausted all the value. And if you just throw like a 20 or 25 multiple, you're at 800 billion to a trillion. If you want to be generous, maybe you go to one and a half trillion. If you go a little higher, 25, 30 times, that's not a great investment over the next five to seven years. So I just want to get you on the record. Are you going to assign any value? Because even though, that it's not in the numbers. You know, Wall Street sees the the body, the progress. We see the videos. There is some incremental value in the stock, even though it might not be a lot. There is some value being put in the stock now because investors do see the bot progressing. They do see FSD progressing. They do see licensing deals are possible. I think that's how you get to the multi-trillion dollar valuation. So I'll be quiet in here and I'd love to get your thoughts. Well, look, I'm an analyst by training and I'm not supposed to be aspirational, meaning that's a derogatory word that we use when people are just throwing numbers up. And I would argue that if you're just saying, okay, well, bots can be, you know, make up a number and make up a TAM and make up a market share, you're throwing numbers up. You're not, you're not doing it in a way that as an analyst I can do with EVs. With EVs, I look at SAR and, you know, we know where SAR is this year and we can look at where SAR is going to be our next couple of years. We look at EV adoption. We come up with an EV share that gives us volume. We can look at average selling price, and I try to do it by model and by, you know, by, you know, how much is Cybertruck, how much is Model Y, how much is Model 3, how much is Model 2, and then we look at margins. And when I do that, I don't get anywhere near close to 40,000 as an ASP. I'm still in the 46 range, 45 range, because Cybertruck is going to be a $60,000 vehicle. And I do believe that as FSD gets better and better, I'm going to have more take rate at, you know, 12,000 or $199 a month. So I don't, I I can get to a $20 price target, which you say, well, that's not that great, but I'm trying to use real numbers. And the problem I have with just making up numbers with FSD is it's aspirational. It's not, there's nothing there yet. It's all, you know, I don't want to say it's a mirage because it's not. But it's a picture of what could be as opposed to what is. So like when you're looking at a drug, you know, whether it be Lilly or Merck, you can look at trials and see how a product does 
versus competition. You can see if it works, if it's efficacious or not. When I'm looking at, you know, pictures of bots, you know, sorting blocks or bending over and, you know, putting boxes, it, it doesn't tell me anything about the TAM. It doesn't tell me anything about competition. It, tells me, it doesn't tell me anything about the pricing. So it's really hard for me to just like throw a number up there and include it because it looks kind of cool, right? I'm a numbers guy. And it doesn't mean that I'm short-sighted. It's just I need a number that I can point to and add, you know, TAM times market share times price times margin, or I can't put it into my model, right? It's just, otherwise you're just making stuff up and I don't do that. With FSD, I've been very clear to people, if the product can get to level four and, and this is a big and, so it's an and statement, and Tesla is willing to assume the liability if something goes wrong, then yeah, that could be a big segment too that I'm not including in my numbers. What I'm including in my numbers is a 12% take rate times half of it at $12,000 per unit of FSD and half of it at $199 a month. And that may be too low a take rate, but at this point, I'm not comfortable just making up a number saying, well, it's going to be 50% or 30% because I just don't see it as being that differentiated by everybody. Everybody's working on autonomy and everybody's trying to build the next bot that can you know, take people out of the assembly line. And to say that Tesla's going to have 100% share of that, I just think that's naive. And that's what I see a lot of people do when they put their numbers out there. So it's not me trying to be conservative for the sake of being conservative. It's just me being an analyst saying, if I can't come up with a formula for estimating volumes and revenues and profits, I can't just make them up. You know, and people say, well, you should just throw something out. Well, that's just not the way I do it. You know, I want to have something I can actually pin my head on. And again, what to me would change my mind on FSD is if Tesla says, we are so confident of autonomy and FSD that we're willing to assume the liability if something screws up. And I don't see them doing that yet. So oh. that's my response to what you said. <laughs> okay, Gary. Well, we're going to get to you soon. We're going to be able to uh, change your mind shortly. We've been having lots of conversations. We are absolutely off different opinions here because there is value in AI. Sure. There's value in FSD. There's value in the bots. There's value in energy, which, you know, you'll be adding a but, Herbert, soon. Can I tell you something? What, what bothers me when you say that nobody puts out a model, people just throw out numbers and say, well, it's going to be twice the level of the car business, or it's going to be $50 billion, but show me, cause I'm an analyst, right? I, I can, I can read numbers. If you say, here's the TAM, here's the market share, Here's the, the the pricing and here's the margins. If you would do that, I would be more convinced. But nobody does that. They just throw numbers out, and that's what bugs me. It's just it's not. It's Did not you feel feel that the the Morgan Stanley anal analysis was also just throwing numbers out? Yes, I did. It's aspirational. It's not what I consider a rigorous analytical framework for thinking about how big the opportunity can be. Yes, I did think it was more aspirational. I appreciate that, Gary, if I could just follow up though. So sure. just with some, you don't have to get into detail, just with a sim simple napkin math. I think you, let, let's not go with the 20 million. Let's say they can get to 10 million, right? Let's say we're in a, a, you know. I use 10 million so, for 2030, by the way. Just right, so. okay, but beautiful. Multiply that by your 46,000, you get $460 billion. Now this is not energy, we're just doing auto. What is their going to bottom line? What's their take? What's their net profit on that? What's your margin on that as net profit? Okay. Well, I don't have anything in front of me because I'm talking for. Well, if you just did it like 10%, it would but be yeah. like 46 billion. So what's the multiple you're going to put on that? You barely get okay. to maybe a one to one and a half trillion dollar valuation. <laughs> That's why I was just trying to pressure you. How do you get so bullish on the stock as a number one or number two name if you're okay. not going to be bullish on these other opportunities? Because it, uh, first of all, you got to factor in that Cybertruck could be, you know, it's probably not, you know, they have 2 million pre-orders. It could be, let's say, 500,000 units a year at an average ASP of, let's call it 60, okay? Because you're going to have some people like me take the tri-motor. You have other people take the, the dual motor, and some people will take the single motor. But I have ASP going from today at, let's call it 45, up to 48 because of Cybertruck and because, you know, you're going to have to layer in more FSD as an extra, okay? Because I assume a higher take rate than what you have today. So let's assume it's 48. So take 10 times 48. I have a gross margin of about 21%. And 
I challenge you. I don't say, well, that's too low, so therefore I can't like the stock. That's what analysts do. They, they, they come up with the, the different pieces. They come up with the ASP. They come up with the volume. They come up with the gross margin. And R&D and SG&A, which is the two fixed costs, get levered so that my operating margin by 2030 is about 16%. Because, you know, that you don't need to keep spending R&D at, at, you know, a 30, growing R&D at a 35% rate. You're leveraging that. So by the time you get to 2030, I get a net income number that's like, I don't know, it's about $90 billion, give or take. So, yeah, and then, then when I take it divided by, let's call that, you know, 4 billion, almost 4 billion shares, I'm at $24 a share. And I don't look and say, well, that's too low to justify the stock. I just look and say, okay, that's what it is. So at that point, what PE do you put on $24 of earnings? And that's a big debate, you know, at least the people I talk to, because at that point, EV adoption's at 60%, and you're not going to grow at 50% a year. You might grow at, you know, I'm using 20% a year because you're already at 60%. So the easy growth is had. I put a one and a half multiple on that. That's 30 times. That's $720. I discount that back at a pretty high cost of equity because FS or Tesla has a very high beta, 1.6. And so I discount that back at a 13.1% cost of equity, and that's how I get $320. But you're right. I don't then say, well, that's too low for me to justify. So let me add some stuff for robots and for maybe FSD license. I don't do that. I try to look at it purely and say, okay, what is the FSD business worth? What is the robot business worth? What is the storage business worth? What is the energy business worth? They add it all up and that's how I get my, my number. But I don't like step back and say, well, that's too low. I can't justify it being number one anymore. So therefore, yeah. let me add some stuff. I just don't do that. Yeah, 100%. I just want to do one more follow-up, and then I'll give it back yeah. to you, Herbert. I, I love that detail, Gary. That was awesome mm -hmm. with the numbers. I just want to ask you one more question, because when you started, you said you were worried about Elon driving costs down, and he's not worried about margins, right? Because his plan is to get units out and then maybe, you know, get FSD and make all the money on the software. So as a portfolio manager, that's your thesis. But the CEO is continually telling you that he's not going to do what your thesis is going to play out as. He's going to do the opposite. So where do you or what percent concern do you have that your thesis is in jeopardy because the CEO of the company you're invested in is going to do the opposite and he's going to move units and drop price and margin and income to get where he wants to go rather than what you think? Well, because that's why it's not my number one position. That's why Google is my number one position. So yeah, if left to, you know, what Elon's saying, I probably wouldn't own it you know, at, at even 8%, which is what we don't, we'd probably drop it to 5% if I believed Elon. I just think at the end of the day, he's got shareholders. And I think, you know, he does respond to the stock price, even though he says he doesn't. And so I think at the end of the day, he's not going to just drop prices. If I look at the master plan one, two, and three, he doesn't talk about taking existing models down in order to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. He doesn't talk about it. He talks about introducing new models, and I'll put models in quotes or in italics or bold or whatever you want to call it. And he talks about you go from the, you know, the Roadster to Model S to Model 3, and we'll put a name on it, Model 2. That's new models. He doesn't talk about continually taking prices down. He talks about introducing models as costs go down, and that's perfectly fine. I, I agree with that. To me, the most important thing Tesla could do, and I've been saying this now for probably three years, is bring out a twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar product. In fact, I remember raising a stink about it a year and a half ago. I was saying, "Why did Elon de-emphasize that?" He said, "Well, that's not you know, that's not our priority." You, you know, but, no, you know why least, they couldn't do it then, right? I, I exactly. It. But why de-emphasize? That's the most important thing. That's part of Master Plan One, Two, and Three is to keep bringing out lower price models. And I'm a big fan of that, but I'm not a fan of taking Model S and X down by 20% when you're not going to get any volume out of it. These are premium price. Products. Apple doesn't do that. Apple doesn't take its flagship products down 15 or 20% to drive volume because there's no demand elasticity. And I've got people say to me, well, that's because interest payments are so high right now and demand would have gone down if he hadn't done that. That's bullshit. When you look at the SAR, I don't know if Ward's put out their SAR number 
for September, but it's 15.5 million. I heard GM did. That's up 15% versus year ago. People are buying lots of cars and Ford and GM and Stellantis are all going to be very close to record profits this year. So when people say, well, you know, if they hadn't taken prices down, they would have been in trouble. Well, that's just not true. When you look at Ford, GM and Stellantis, they didn't take prices down, but they're doing just fine. So I'm just not a fan of taking prices down to me. That lacks creativity. Go out and use other tools in the marketing kit to drive EV adoption. There are so many people out there, and you guys know this because you talk to them, who don't know what a Tesla costs. They think a Tesla costs $80,000, and it doesn't. You can buy a Tesla, and you got a $7,500 IRA credit. You can get into a Model 3 for $32,000, and nobody knows that. Why not? Yeah, it's- Why not? that weapon instead of just keep dropping prices we've had this conversation too often gary but i mean if you had your way gary there would not have been price cuts in january and that we would be having such great margins based on what you're saying and guess what you would not be able to say today that the ev cars are now at parity or even cheaper uh, than ice cars that is the model they have to bring it down to that price and then they move forward from there. So if you had your way, Gary, no price cuts at all, we'd still be way up above everyone else. And you'd say, hey, I'm, you're happy. And that's not the right strategy. No, I wouldn't have been ha- I wouldn't be happy. What I would say is the price cuts have not driven volume. And look, I can't look back and say we should have done this or should have done that the way you are. What I can say is people started the year with a 1.8 million forecast for 2023. And Elon started the year at a 1.8 million forecast, and that's where we still are. So it's hard for me to look back and say the price cuts have gotten any volume. You're saying that they have. I don't know if they have. I mean, the forecasts haven't changed. Uh, Wall Street's forecast is still 1.8. Management's forecast is still 1.8. In fact, when Elon was on, I guess it was the fourth quarter, first quarter, said 1.8, maybe 2 million. And now they're saying around 1.8. So I don't think they've gotten much volume by cutting price you know, to your point, but I know that their margins are a lot less. Gary, wouldn't it be even worse with the Fed continuing to uh, raise interest rates? They, they needed to do that to drive volume, right? But you you look at everybody else, guys. You don't just look at Tesla, look at GM, Ford, and Stellantis. They They are selling to their dealers, Gary. They are not selling to the, to the, the the, the inventory can't, can't just sit at dealers. Okay. Somehow, the cars are getting to customers' hands or they would just sit on dealers' lots. And look, I don't want to get into, like we did last time, six people against me. I'm not going to do that, okay? But We're only five. <laughs> whatever it is, it's just, it's not fun, okay? <laughs> but I'm just telling you, people know my view. I just think, be creative. I used to be a brand manager. Hire some marketing people who can educate why people should be in EVs and tr- take some of the billion dollars you're spending on price cuts Take 50 million, 100 million, and just try it and see if you can get some of that EV adoption instead of just continually cutting price, which is very uncreative. It's a blunt instrument. It's lazy. Okay. You, you can cut price all day long, to your point, and try to make it up on FSD, but that's a very lazy way of doing it. Why don't you try to be creative and try to educate people why they should buy an EV? And, you know, there's a marketing term it's called product as hero. Feature Teslas as your product hero in your ads. And see if it works at least instead of just bland, you know, blindly cutting price. And it's like throwing shit up on the lawn, hoping that it works. But it didn't work with S and X, right? We didn't see yeah. much response. So I agree with you, Gary. Can... We're I'm having a civilized conversation. No one's going to jump on you. We're, we're just having a nice civilized conversation. Know, but, but I'm trying you're... to get at the matter because what I see, like I'm a numbers guy in, in a general sense. Like on a gap basis this year, Tesla's earnings, they're going to earn less money than they earned a year before. So again, I'm, I'm going to your thinking from a numbers guy and a valuation guy as a yeah. number one or two position. If they do $3 this year, I think that's where Wall Street has the gap earnings, three, not the adjusted, the gap, yeah, $3. Yeah, that $3. means you have an 80 multiple on earnings that are flatlined. And if you go one year out, with interest rates maybe going up another 25 basis points. And, and again, it looks like just from our eyes that demand is a little bit soft. And I don't think margins are going to get super you know, better, even if COGS get a little better. I don't know if it's going to be able to offset all these price cuts into next year. So if you're doing a one-year price target out, and let's say next year we do a little bit better in earnings, maybe we get closer to four. You know, four and say you know the Fed's still pretty tight and they haven't cut – you know, if you put a 70 or 80 multiple, which is a huge multiple on a, or earnings that aren't growing year over year for a couple of years, you have like a, you know, a $300 stock. So that's what I'm trying to 
get from you, don't you have to start at least trying to say this stock? Yes, it's a fundamental business. The auto and the energy is great. But I'm just trying to get you to be a little bit. I know you can't put in the numbers, but I just I find it hard for it to be a bullish pick if you don't give some credit to some of these other things that they're doing on the artificial intelligence side. But I'm not trying to I don't to know if you want to give I'm any not, credence to it. I, yeah. I just feel like you're trying to make up stuff to be bullish based on those assumptions. And that's not how analysts behave. Analysts do their numbers and they don't say, oh, well, this isn't enough to justify like in the stock. So therefore, let me make up some numbers on the, the bot side or let me make up some numbers on the FSD side to justify why I like the stock. That's just not the way you do it. What you do is you look at the different revenue and profit streams, add them up, and that's your valuation. You compare that to the price and you don't like try to fabricate stuff to, so that you can justify owning the position. I don't do that. I hope you don't do that. No, I don't do that. But if you're not going to give any credit, you're just going to do it from a hardware perspective and you're not giving any credit to, you know, software other than some a little bit of FSD increased take rate. I don't know why you would assign such a huge multiple to a company that's basically it's it's earnings is all through through the metal. It's all through the metal. It's either storage or cars. I don't know why you're assigning it like a hundred mm -hmm. multiple because that's where you have to get your numbers. What's no, your 2024 no. earnings estimate? Well, it's 540, but my 2030 estimate, because I look past 2024, is 24 bucks. And it, you know, let's call it, you know, where, wherever the stock is today, you know, it's a, it's like a 10 multiple on 20 on 2030 earnings. That's dirt cheap. So I look at things out five, seven years. And if I'm at 2030 and I say, where should the stock trade? And this is the bottom line in 2030, it really comes down to what multiple do you put on those $24 of earnings, which is largely based on hardware to your point. Okay. But there's energy and there's, you know, there's storage in there. So at $24 in earnings, do you put a 30 multiple? Can you justify a 30 multiple? I can, because I think at that point, when you have 60% AV adoption, you can have a 20% long-term growth rate. So therefore I can put a 30 multiple and I can own this stock because I have a $720 valuation, for lack of a better word, by 2030, I discount it back, I get, you know, $320. That's still, what is that, 25% upside. So, and look, if I could be convinced, and you, you brought this up, if you have Model 3 pricing going up, and if you have no cuts in Model Y, that gives me more conviction. I hold my numbers back because I just don't have conviction that they're not going to take prices down again next year. I hope they do. I hope they leave them where they are. But if they look, if they were to, I know the way institutions think, if they were to take Model Y prices down 15 to 20 percent again, because he's producing more than he's getting orders on, because to your point, interest rates are going higher and therefore people aren't ordering cars as much. I'm telling you, the stock is not going to be at 250 bucks. It's going to be much lower. It will, because people will have to take their earnings numbers down for next year. I appreciate <laughs> the answer. Thanks uh, for engaging with me. Go ahead. I think Jeff wanted yeah. to ask uh, a question. Before we get to believe... Jeff, so folks, uh, this is a fantastic conversation. Great debate happening here. Please follow the folks on the panel. Everybody would really appreciate that. We have the Cyber Bowl spaces every Tuesday. We have the actual show on YouTube every Friday. Thank you so much, Gary. You're just providing tremendous uh, value here for us. Uh, please, if you can, uh, share this space. Let's get more people in here. And then later we will be you know, allowing people to come up on the um, the panel. So get your questions ready, send them out on tweets. Thank you so much, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, my comment was from five minutes ago, but it was really around the, what, why are, you know, why is the SAR up on, you know, non-Tesla and why are they able to ship and, and ship at those margins? The reason is they were undersupplied for the last two to three years and they have a lot of pent up demand. They, they weren't able to ship cars. Tesla recovered from COVID and, and from the silicon issue, probably 18 months sooner than uh, legacy autos. So that's, I'm not saying that's the entire reason. I'm just saying that's a reason why legacy auto is able to, you know, or so this year versus last year. Last year, they were woefully undersupplied, you know, again, due to the, their slow recovery. That, that was it. That was my point. So you think it's a supply issue as opposed to demand issue? Yeah. I don't, yeah. I honestly think the reason why you, we've had these record, you know, call it Stellantis for GM shipments is they had pent up demand and 
and they were so undersupplied. I mean, it's it was a multi year thing. It wasn't a yeah, it was three years ago. Yeah. yeah, and they didn't recover. Just if you look at their inventory levels, they didn't get back to 50, 60 days of inventory. I want to say till earlier this year. Record and, profits in twenty twenty one. You know that GM Ford. Look at GM Ford Stellantis earnings. They had record profits in twenty. So did Tesla. I know, but the point is that GM. Everybody keeps saying GM Ford and Stellantis are hurting. They're not hurting. They've been having record profits for three years oh, in a row. It's not just this oh, year. Yes. No, but you know, Gary, if you look at their volumes pre-COVID to now, their volumes are flattened down. I get that. Um, so, so they're selling. They're so basically they've jacked up the price of cars through COVID pricing, and they've been slow to peel that off because they were undersupplied. I think. But I know. I, I by the way, I'm not solely against this argument of. I think you know Tesla may have been a little bit too aggressive on the price reductions. I'm not saying this is a zero sum game. It just, they're just one yeah. of the causes. Yeah. Look, I, I don't know if it's supply or it's demand driven. What I could say is that despite interest rates going up as much as they have this year, I can look at SAR and it's up 15% year over year. And I look at the GM Ford and Stellantis earnings and they're very close to the 21 records because they all had record profits in 2021. Slight dip last year as rates started to rise. And they seem to be doing just fine. They're not doing fine on their EVs, but that's because, you know, Tesla's crushing them in EVs and people would rather buy, you know, if you, if you make a decision you're going to buy an EV, you, you're better off buying a Tesla. But relative to ICE cars, they're doing okay. And they will have close to record profits this year. And everybody who says, well, the price cuts are crushing, you know, the legacy goes, look at their earnings. They're going to be close to records this year. So I don't think they're hurting. Yes, if you go out to 2030 and they can't, be- change their mix to be mostly EVs, then they're going to be hurting. I agree with that. But that's going to be more a function of the twenty-five to $30,000 car getting out. And to me, okay, so Cybertruck is really important because it's 20% of the TAMS pickups. And Tesla, unfortunately, you know, is just getting the Cybertruck out now, you know, four years later, whatever. But that twenty-five to $30,000 car is a game changer. That is game over to me for the legacy autos, if they can get it out there. I just don't know when it's going to be out because, you know, originally it was supposed to be in Mexico and then Mexico got delayed. Now they're saying they're going to build it in Austin. The quicker they get out there, the quicker you put more misery into the legacy auto guys, because they can't build a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 EV like Tesla can, you know, and that, that to me is, that's where you really get excited about the stock is if they can get that out there and put it out and, you know, make, let's make up a number, two to three million units. I don't know how, back to the 10 million that Christian was saying, or maybe it was you saying, Jeff, I don't know how you get there unless you can build like a factory a year from here until 2030, right? Well, they're going right to improve, they're improve their output per square meter, Gary. And the other thing is, I, I think you should consider this. I think they're pulling in the schedule for the Model 2 version by building it in Austin. I think the move, that decision is actually going to be a schedule pulling because it's right under their engineering team. I agree. And look, I don't have a problem with that. I think that's very smart. Labor's higher, but at least you can control it better and, and put pressure on these guys to get it done quicker. That's my biggest worry is, you know, are they going to be able to actually get to 10 million units in 2030 unless they really start building out gigafactory? Or to your point, you, you basically build it in Shanghai, Austin, and Berlin, you expand, you know, the footprints. Right now, their capacity for next year is only 2.7. You know, you got to get it up to 10 million. How do you get there? You got to build more factories. Well, the other piece of it is improving the output per square meter, which is basically one of their tenants. So they're going to get more, that 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 footprint that's producing 500,000 cars today, I believe in a couple of years, we'll be producing 800K to a million in the same actual footprint. So that's one of their core tenants is focusing on output per square meter. But how do you get to 10 million like that way? If you're only at two today, that's a five-fold increase. Like they're not yeah. building any new factories today. No, they're yeah, adding. They are, exactly. They're making them bigger. In Berlin, it's going to be triple. In Austin, it's at least double. In Nevada? Yeah. But that's not five-fold. That's not a five-fold. That's a double. But, but if you improve your output per square meter, you're going to, if you double your output per square meter, that's a double right there. And then if you add, you know, foot, I mean, this isn't to me. This isn't a rocket science to them. I think they're gonna be able to build. They're gonna do the additions or add at a you know discrete site like Mexico and India, and they're gonna be there. I hope so. I mean, that's but again, 
that's the aspir- that's when you know investing becomes more aspirational. You're saying, well, I hope they get there. I hope that FSD gets to level four, and I hope that Tesla accepts the legal responsibility in order to be, you know, granted a robo taxi license. Because if they don't accept the liability, they're not going to get granted a robo taxi license. And that's why I always stop short of building a model that says, okay, let's take however people do it. You know, number of hours a day trips per day, dollars per trip, you know, put a market share on it and come up with a take rate for Tesla. I don't do that because I don't know when Tesla is going to accept legal responsibility where they could have a robo taxi deployment license. I don't know. And same thing with the factories. Yeah, I get that they could increase square foot usage, whatever term you use. I get that. But to me, that's aspirational. I want to see new factories being built in addition to that. In order to get to yeah, ten, yeah. they're already doing that. They're already do. They're already improving their output. I mean, that's not as that's how they actually operate. Yeah. But I understand your point. The other, the other thing, just quickly saying that quickly to close is from an investor perspective, I actually don't want them building a new factory in a new geo unless there's a customer base that's going to actually take right. the TAM up. I'd rather see them expand in existing factories and then improve the output per square meter because that's going to give you the greatest ROIC and return on labor. I'm Me done. Too. Me too. I just don't know if it's going to be enough to get to 10 million. I agree with you hundred percent, but I, yeah. I want them also to be building new factories because I think you, you can get from 2.7 to five doing what you're saying. I just don't know if you can get from five to 10 without building new factories. That's all. Okay. Let's have a uh, moment. Oh, sorry, Xander. Were you going to say something? Sorry. Uh, hey, Gary. Isn't the entire point, right, with Elon guiding that the company is going in the direction of FSD, they just want the units so that they can sell the FSD? Herbert pointed out a couple of Cyber Bowl episodes ago that every single time there's some kind of partnership, like with Hertz and then Ford, right, that's what got us out of the 190s that the stock and Wall Street reacts. So what happens if Ford partners? Obviously, in, in my opinion, the, the, they have to take liability. I believe Mercedes is doing that, right, with their 40 mile an hour uh, thing. So they're gonna go in that direction. So what, what happens if Ford goes ahead and, and partners with FSD? And now, they, I mean, they're, I imagine they're gonna be required to take responsibility if anything bad happens or maybe an an agreement between the two companies but nevertheless what do you think of that i think they will at some point they're going to get if you look at my cows there's going to be some fsd licensing deal i don't know if it's going to be ford but it could be toyota it could be honda it could be somebody somebody will agree that they're so far behind on autonomy that they'll use tesla so i agree with the, the the view and if that happens you get one of them that's much more, much more lucrative. It's much higher fee. So if that happens, yes, yeah, stock is up five percent. That will be a beneficiary of that by owning, you know, eight percent of the portfolio in Tesla. But I'm not going to make it a twenty percent position as some people have it or higher, based on the the premise that there's going to be some FS and you know ten FSD licensing deals. There might be, but at this point, I'm not willing to bet the ranch on that. I hope there is. So I agree with your point that if there is a deal like that, the stock will go up. No question. Are are you able to model then at that point? Uh, And what what would you be considering? I get the numbers, what kind of licensing fee they're getting. But, you know, it's interesting to me. Everybody has been saying that, including that FSD is ahead of everybody else, and yet there's no licensing deal yet. I do believe there's going to be more, too, because I'm breaking up a little bit, Gary. I'm very, I believe you're breaking up quite a bit. There's going to be a deal, but I can't put a billion dollars in there because I have no idea when it's going to be or how big it's going to be. You know, I just don't know. Otherwise, I'm making up numbers. I do. Okay. But I do believe Sorry, JP, a deal. we'll get to you, JP, shortly. I just want to, I forgot completely to let Alexandra ask a question. Gary, if you can, please try to see if you can fix your connectivity. Can you believe that you nearly forgot me, Herbert? How did you do that? <laughs> Never. Let me see if I can move from where I am. Yeah, per- because you want to you wanna listen to me, Gary, don't you? I'm in my office and I'm... Take I'm your time. Going. And, and while, while we're transitioning, uh, I did want to say, 
thank you for helping retail shareholders understand Wall Street. Helpful, Stop sucking up. Oh, my God. No, it's, 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 look, it, it helped me uh, find conviction in Tesla when Wall Street, you know, when I can understand what Wall Street's up to. And uh, Gary's been there to, to help. Hello? Okay. Is the reception any better? I appreciate that. It is. Much better, much it's better. much better. It's much better. Yeah. And you got your soft talk. I hope you heard it. <laughs> Good. So I have a, a question that's, that has a couple of elements in it. But before we get to that one, do you hear any rumors for the Cybertruck event? Because you're usually well informed. Is there anything crystallizing that you have heard? We've been saying fourth quarter forever, uh, for at least six months. And I don't know where the Wall Street Journal got the idea that it was going to be third quarter. And, of course, they got to run a headline saying it had been delayed. We've been saying fourth quarter. I, I talked to IR. Let's see what they – I actually met with them last week, and I got the sense it was going to be after earnings. And I don't know when, but I would say it's sometime November now. I don't think it's going to be – you know, because earnings – yeah, earnings are going to be October – what. 18, yeah. yes. It could be the end of October, but you would look, they need a couple of weeks to send out invites. And, you know, logistically, it's a pain in the ass to set up one of these events. And I don't think they're going to do anything before earnings. So I would say early November would be my best guess. But it's going to be okay. fourth quarter. I have no doubt it'll be fourth quarter. Well, we are in the fourth quarter now. And actually, the idea of uh, third quarter was by, by Elon. It was Elon who said it would be in September in, in one of the earnings calls. So I don't Didn't remember whether it was. Did he kind of hint that maybe it would be <clears throat> September? Did he really say well, it, was... I, it was quite affirmative. But I mean, it, it isn't September anymore, that's for sure. And just so that I can share that with people, and there's no guarantee for anything, but there seems to be quite a few leaks out of the Austin factory for October 30th, which is a Monday. So I don't know. Yeah. How Usually firm that is. On Tuesdays, exactly, Monday. exactly, and and so that's why I pointed out that it is a Monday. Just... Yeah, that's a fair date. I mean, November first, <laughs> October thirty first. To me, that's the same, but it'll be early fourth quarter, like at the okay. time. Okay, perfect. Then, I mean, you know how much I'm in love with Adam Jonas's report, right? I think I read these sixty six pages now ten times. Mm. I know you think it's fantasy land, but I, I actually think there's much more behind it than it looks like initially. But what is my go-to place at the moment is what's called Exhibit 37, if ever you want to go back to it, it's on page 29, which is his price target methodology, where he has the three tables, the bear case, the base case, and the bull case. And where you will actually agree is his bull case only counts for 10 million cars, right? So he's not one of those 20 million by 2030. He's, his, his best case, his bull case is at 10 million. His base case is under 8 million. And his bear case is only at 5.5 million in 2030. So that's giving, you know, that's giving you some thought for that. Can they even get to 10 million? But what I found is very interesting is that he's giving about 10% of the value to powertrains sold to third parties. And that was the first analyst where I had this element in it, where I, you know, I mean, we know all about the FSD and the operating system and whatever, but here we're talking really about the powertrain. Is mm -hmm. this something you have ever thought through? And, and in their case, in the 10 million units bull case, they would sell an, another 3 million powertrain EV in that bull case scenario and and the powertrain sales bring in about 12 to 15 percent of the total value well that's a lot i haven't thought through that look when even with charging it's all these third-party charging deals is not a big number but you know fsd because there's a lot of ai involved and again take toyota take you know honda they're not anywhere near where tesla is on fsd I still think that is probably the biggest value added. I don't know enough, to be honest, about, you know, why people can't make powertrains. I mean, to me, you know, that, that seems like something that they've been making for years and years, where I think something like FSD is so new, and they recognize that's going to be an integral part of the car going forward, especially as all cars can self-drive at some point. So I think if people find that they're really behind, they would license it from Tesla or somebody else. But I don't know why they would, you know, pay money for somebody's powertrain. They didn't know how to make powertrains, I would think. No? Uh, I think that the one thing why I'm so interested in this uh, study, 
made by Jonas is that his second biggest account he follows and the only second buy rating he has other than on Ferrari and some battery builder that I forgot is on Ford. He has a buy rating on Ford. So he's very knowledgeable about Ford and his Ford reports are really in depth. I mean, not that I'm really interested in his Ford reports, but I just think that for somebody to suddenly come up with a with such a huge EV powertrain part of the business and mm. this person also being the lead analyst on Ford and having a buy rating on Ford while on everything else he has an auto, he has a sell rating just gave me some pause, right? I mean, I may be speculating in the wrong direction, but there could be something. Yeah, there could be. But I, I think you're, you're forgetting that, you know, the sell side and you're saying there could be a deal between them. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I do also believe Ford is going to be their first client for uh, FSD deals. I mean, there, there seem to be huge rumors currently circulating in Europe that we're very close to Stellantis announcing a deal with Tesla. I mean, I, I don't know enough since Stellantis has been such a patchwork of different companies, whether that is really to be taken serious. I've really lost, you know, when there were still single units, I sort of had an, a feeling on them. But now as this conglomerate, I don't have a feeling for it. So maybe it is Stellantis. But for me, it was always clear that the first FSD client will be Ford. Yes. I don't know. I mean, that's to me, that's aspirational. I don't want to bank on owning Tesla because Ford is the first FSD client. I do believe there will be at least one. I just think Ford is investing a lot in autonomy. I'm not sure if they're getting any bang for the buck out of Waymo, but you know, to me, it's you know they're investing in it. So it's possible, but I look, then I'm making stuff up by saying, you know, 50% odds, 60% odds, 10% odds, I don't know. I've always felt that it's really hard for somebody to cede autonomy to Tesla because going forward, self-driving cars is going to be a really important part of the value of the car. So I would think like BYD decided to do it on their own rather than you know, pay licensing fees to Baidu in China. I think it's very hard for someone like Ford or GM or even Stellantis to cede that to Tesla. I think one of the smaller companies or people who are not investing in autonomy or not that far along on it, they'd be more likely to send it. But to, to your point, if there's one, people are going to assume there's going to be many. And I just don't know the economics of, you know, if somebody decides they're going to pay licensing fees to Tesla, I don't even know how to model that because I don't know what the specifics are of what a licensing deal would be. You know, I think we'll have to cross that bridge when we get there. I would just rather, for conservatism's sake, take, you know, the number of cars, take, you know, the percentage that decide to take FSD and maybe assume, you know, one or two more. So then I'd have a higher take rate, quite frankly, like instead of 12, maybe I'd have 18. I'd rather model it that way than assume, you know, a whole bunch of licensing agreements between the, the parties. I just, okay, understood. understood. I'm not smart now, enough to be honest with you, and I don't have inside information. About no, you're smarter than most of us. There's no, no doubt about that. But I have right. a last question. So we don't, have, we don't have Zach Kirk on in the coming earnings call. We have probably his successor. I'm sure I botched the name, but Weibar Taneja, I think is the name. Did you yeah. meet him when you went to San Francisco? I did not. Oh, uh, okay. No. I'll have Taneja. No, I met with Martin, you know, who's the IR guy. And look, I didn't have a lot of time, to be honest with you, with Martin. And with Martin, he doesn't ever give you inside information. And they were in a quiet period. So he's not going to tell me anything. The only thing that I gleaned from the was when I was pushing him on when will Model 3 get to the U.S.? He said to me, because I said, well, I hear it's not going to be the first quarter. It was a little bit of a trick question. He says, why do you think that? And I said, because that's what I've heard the rumors are, that you're going to wait till the first quarter. And, you know, we get into a philosophical debate about why would you wait if you could get it into the U.S. in the fourth quarter? Why wouldn't you do it? Because otherwise, people are going to hold off on buying Model 3, which made me believe that they are probably going to get the Model 3 Highland into the U.S. in the fourth quarter and not wait till first quarter. Um, that'd be great. I mean, that'd be and, obviously great, yeah. And the only other thing I got was just, we were talking about Cybertruck, and I said, you know, every time I see a Cybertruck, I see all these swarms of people taking pictures of it. He says, Gary, you have no idea. We were sitting on University Avenue. We were having a drink. And, he, you know, it's very narrow. He says, can you imagine if a Cybertruck drives up University Avenue because it's very narrow, you would literally clog up the street because so many people are trying to get in front of it, behind it, so they could take a selfie with it. 
that's going to be what happens. So in, you know, it's funny when, when I took, I come from a blue collar family, they drive pickup trucks. None of them like the side truck, but they're all my age. And when you talk to people that are like in their thirties and forties, they love it. But people my age, except me, I think it's gorgeous, but you know, people my age generally do not like the look of it. And I just think it's going to be such an attention grabber that it's going to give, uh, you know, a whole new boost to Tesla's awareness and Tesla's franchise that you're going to have. Maybe people aren't interested in Cybertruck, but they'll buy a Model 3, they'll buy a Model Y because they're going to be interested in what is the Cybertruck. It's just going to, it's, a, it's an attention grabber. And I don't think people get that. My partner and I argue about this all the time. He just thinks it's ugly, but it doesn't matter if it's ugly. It's different. It'll get people's attention and people go to the website and maybe they'll buy a Model 3 or maybe they'll buy a Model Y. You know, the old saying, no publicity is bad publicity. It's going to be great publicity when people are taking selfies of themselves next to a cyber truck and posting it all over the internet. I Co completely people... agree. And beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And actually, it's one of those cars. More you see it, more you love it. So, uh, Absolutely. I... Okay. Jerry, yeah. we're, you're, we're just, you're, you seem to be winning uh, some of us over here. Alexandra said she was going to... No, that no. was weak. We're going to need no. to bring JP up to push back on him. I'm the only one that has done it. Meantime, Xander's going to say some more sweet words to you, Gary. No, don't say anything sweet. I'd rather you be provocative. You're we're not gonna, getting gonna, sweet from me, Gary. Sorry about that. I know. I never get sweet. We got to get some imagination into you, Gary. I love your numbers. Just a little bit of imagination. <laughs> Just... I'll, I'll try. I'll try. So, so, Gary, you said that you know others will solve FSD2, and, and I've heard you speak about that, but like if V12 is an order of magnitude smaller in the code, if they went from like 300,000 lines of code to let's say three, and you're building out this dojo and all of these computers to process all of this video data, isn't there a moat there? And are you, you, I imagine you're aware of all of those details. So how, how do you not have some sort of number and like, how if if the data is the, the really the the oil of the new oil how do those other manufacturers solve you know s solve it if they're not pursuing it the same way look you could go from 300,000 lines of code to 3,000 lines of code but it still has to work meaning it has to not have an intervention 99.99% of the time and you know i don't care who it is you're not getting numbers like that you know, I drove with the person who pub probably posts more videos about FSD than anybody oh else. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> oh. And, you know, in my drive, he picked me up at where I was with Martin. Or no, I was, it was the next day. I was having a dinner with a potential client. And he had to intervene twice, you know. And it's like, that's not 99.99% of the time. So well, he doesn't have V12, though, right? That's oh, my of course point. not. And look, I'm willing to give Tesla the advantage over everybody else. And all I'm saying is everybody is working on this. Everybody knows that autonomy is where they have to be in, you know, 99 point, you know, I'll pick whatever nine you want. Just even 99% of the time, it has to work without an intervention in order for it to be really a value. And I think Tesla will get there first. I just believe that others will get there as well. And, you know, the other thing, a lot of people don't talk about this. Everybody's got hardware three. So when you're in hardware four, what do you do with all these hardware three cars? Do they get to 99.9% .9 with V12? Or because they don't have, you know, radar on the front and they don't have that extra camera front, they can never get there. I don't know. I don't know the answer. Maybe they do. So I just keep going back to, you can have 300,000 lines of code go down to three, but it still has to work, right? It still has to be effective where 99.9% .9 of the time you don't intervene or it's not going to have the value that you guys all think it's going to have. Okay. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. I just don't know. Finally, we're going to be able to bring JP up. Thank you for being so patient with us. And we'll also bring up some more speakers up there. Meantime, folks, please follow the speakers on the panel board here. <laughs> and then also share this space to get more people up here. JP, thank you for being patient. Come on up. Yeah, no, no worries, guys. I love the conversation. But I think maybe if we could hey, kind of pivot. Hey, Gary. And to be fair, I agree with Gary on the FST thing. And I think... Xander, to answer your question more succinctly, the reason why you can't assign value is because there's no revenue today. So if you take anything multiplied by zero, it's zero. So not to say that Tesla will solve it, not to say you can't, that- You can't hear JP? Gary, it looks like you can't hear JP. Okay, so. I, I can. I'm sorry. There was somebody that was uh, texting me and I was trying to text them back, but go ahead. 
Do it Sorry. again. Sorry. So I agree with Gary there. JP? I, can you hear me now? Hello? Gary, it sounds like you can't hear. JP, you need to bring go down and go back up again. Can you guys hear? Yes. Yeah. We can, we hear, can hear both of you. Yes. How come I can't hear him? That's so weird. He, he's gone glitch. down. He has gone That's down. Just... He will come back. But please don't text at the same time because that may make it happen <laughs> again. He said, but he's not actually right. Like FSD does provide revenue. There are people that subscribe for the service at what a couple hundred dollars a month. You can buy it now, still for ten thousand. I know it's small, but there is a if you believe the tech rate, oh. the rate is going up, right? And it's going to be over more cars. You can multiply something and get a value for FSD. It's That's exactly what I do. And I do assume a twelve percent take rate, and I keep the price where it is, and I assume half buy it and half lease it, and that's what I do with my revenue numbers. But it's not a big number when you multiply it out. Even in 2030, I think it's like of my $320 price target, I think it's like 10%, maybe. It's not a big, it's not a huge number. Where you really get big numbers on FSD is by having RoboTaxi and assume, you know, there's a couple million cars out there that Tesla's collecting, let's say 25% of the revenue. Then you get big numbers, but then you're just throwing numbers up there. And I can't do that. Because it may work, but it may not. And you don't know how many other people are going to be able to do what they do. Go ahead, JP. I agree. Are you back? JP, are you back? Hey, can you hear me now? Gary, okay. can you hear him? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I, by the way, great conversation. Thanks for everyone. Sorry about the tech issue. I agree with Gary and FSD. And to be fair, I personally think they're going to solve it. I think the only ones are going to be at to level five first. I think it is a moat. The main problem is the incremental revenue in the short term, right? to assume the, versus the liability, it's just not worth it, right? To give it to Ford or to someone else in, in a public civil use case, I think it's, there's no revenue upside to, to leading with this now. And I think that's why they're holding back at level two. And to be fair, I think we waste a lot of time about something that we know that, you know, will come to fruition at some point. But like, you know, I think Christian asked earlier, you know, what's the thesis today, right? How does Gary get there? Personally, I think 10 million is, is hard. You know, that's 10% of the global SAR. I don't like to get to 2030. I think that's too far away for me to guess what's going on. I like to look like maybe 24, 36 months out. Realistically, I think 5 million cars with the existing footprint is very doable. The Shanghai alone is at 1.85 now, like today. And that's before the, the Gen when 3 car. So I... When you say it's at 1.85... It, they're only making 80000 a week. I know. Today. That's a I million. I agree. But so what my understanding of the testing that they did is to, they got approval to max capacity of 5,000 units per day. They're going to run somewhere around 4,000 to 4,500. And it's going to be a combination of essentially the new Model 3 that's easier to make. And when they update the Y, they'll be able to churn out the existing vehicles much quicker. Like, I think we talked about this on the phone, like, the assembly of the motors, the new hairpin motors alone, is a seismic step change of the production. So when will you see that, JP? When will you see the 80000 a month go to 150000 So I think I've I mean, seen them flash this, which we don't really remember. They did like 111000 production in a couple of months when they did the test trial. Uh, I think it was last year in Q4, right? So they did the test run in September 28th to November, like, 19th or something last year and that's when we saw that massive q3 from china and i think that was the blueprint that's in that went into fremont when they started to do the the changeover in fremont in q4 and q1 and then that's what they've been doing in texas today and as alexander correctly pointed out berlin has been very underutilized in footprint they've been capped from a government approval perspective to 500,000 units they got approval to go to a million and with the new production facilities within the existing footprints, forget about even making it bigger. What, what Jeff was saying earlier about utilizing the square footage and efficiency, like each of the new gigas, and I say new gigas meaning Shanghai, Austin, Berlin, are going to have around a 2 million unit capacity. Not today, like Shanghai is there now, but like they're the easiest because of three and Y. The, I think, Berlin will get there the fastest if they can get through the approvals, but Austin's going to be trickier because Cybertruck is a different vehicle, you know, component that just banging out threes and Ys. So I think mm -hmm. I agree. I agree with the sentiment, GP. I just don't think Shanghai 
you wouldn't buy cap X to one eight and idle it because you get crushed. No, you get crushed. I think they're going to run around one point six five to one point seven five. That's where we're going to be now. Okay. I mean, I guess they have to do it, but I, I'd be surprised if they had if they procured all that cap X and the labor, and then they're not actually no. I so using. So they, they, I mean, to be fair, this is not like a normal process. They had to go to the Shanghai government and get the approval. They ran. And they had to do the environmental assessment. They had to do the, the labor assessment. They had to do all these things to get approval. I personally think that the, you know, this is, we're going to see some, like when the Model 3 of Thailand is in full ramp, we're going to see the change. Because like the Model Y with the rear wheel drive is now the highest margin vehicle Tesla makes. It's the least components with the highest price point. It's the, the, lo- the least amount of parts. It's very simple. And I think it's going to be a warm weather taxi car everywhere. It's going to be the number one sold Uber, Lyft, their car for the 24 in probably in the world, to be honest with you. Hmm. That would be my, that is the perfect airport vehicle. It's a perfect urban taxi. And the, the main thing, which we're not talking about, the, the shift in the battery to LFP, different than the NMC batteries. These batteries are designed to go from you charge them to 100%, you run them to zero, you charge it to 100 the old batteries were best maintained for a uh, lifetime to be somewhere between 25 and, and 75%. Um, if you ran them full cycles, they would degrade faster. The LFP batteries are meant to literally go to 100, go to zero. That's And they have that durability and, and reliability there. So I think like there's just been a lot of delays. But what, you know, the reason why LFP couldn't expand as fast because the patent didn't expire until last year. Then when the patent expired... Then they had to go through the procurement process and the build process. And then they were working on the motor development. So like, I think that the, everyone's been hyper-focused on price. We didn't really look at the prices. No one's looking at the prices pre-COVID and what the margins were leading up to that. Everyone saw the prices go up. You know, I personally look at those prices from that period and, and everyone knows they were unsustainable across the board, but the margins were really strong, quote unquote, in Tesla's capacity. But they were still losing money on building a small amount of cars from like Berlin and, and Texas. So like the margins were actually better because Berlin and Austin were dragging the entire, you know, the unit economics down because there were so few cars coming out of those factories. I think in a normalized setting, the plan was to always have these cars hover around this price and have a mid 20s multiple. Like that's what Zach and Elon had targeted. No one forecasted the COVID coming in. And I think that, Gary, you're right on the SAR number. And Jeff's correct to point out the production pump. But there are massive droves of cars and dealers that are counting as GM SAR and while they're in Ford and Stellantis. And while a lot of them are recording good profits and they're recording higher ASP, you know, highest ASP or higher than normal ASPs without cutting price, they are doing less units. Like GM is down almost 25% units from before. It's, bizarre, it's over a million cars from Asia. Like they have lost a huge amount of almost 50% of their Asia, over 50% of their Asia business since pre-pandemic. And th- this year they're tracking worse uh, than, than even before. And I think that's partly because China has been, the EVs from China brands have done well and have been receptive on the lower end. But I do think like, Tesla and is eating their lunch and a lot of core capacities because like Buick prior going, if you go back to like mid 2000s, Buick was one of the top selling cars in China as a luxury, a mid-level luxury accessible vehicle. You know, Tesla has kind of taken over that, that middle market luxury consumer in the tier one, tier two cities in China. And I think that like, I think the, their financial accounting, like they're making most of their earnings in GM, like in their financial units, right? So what they can generate in interest payments um, and loans, it's not really in unit economics that they're blowing out earnings. And I think we're going to kind of, it's going to get messy in the next 12 months for the legacy OEMs because the financials are not going to be able to save them um, when they start mark to market, their lease is coming back on their books. So like, but if I can, I I know just spit a bunch of shit. I think the main thing, Christian, to your I think 5 million cars, Gary, Gary's 100% correct. Cybertruck's going to raise the ASP. I personally think that the majority of units are going to be at least dual motor. I think you're going to see it skew towards the tri-motor for two reasons. One is this is the first 
relatively low priced vehicle that qualifies for the the US 179 tax exemption. So the fact of the matter is if it's priced 60 or if it's priced $79,000, it doesn't matter. It's the same reason why G-Wagons are sold out in the US every single year in Range Rovers. They're 150 grand, but you can write off 100% of the, of the cost as a part of an LLC because it meets that. Throw in the IRA credit on top of that and the actual specs of the vehicle. This is going to be one of the most bought after bought cars in an LLC for like sole proprietors in the US because of the, the characteristics of it. So did you get an ASP of 50? You do 5 million cars, you look at $250 billion, 20% margin, you're at 50 billion net income in 2025. If you do 300 billion, you do 100, sorry, 300 gigawatt hours of energy by 2025, 2026, that's 150 billion. A 30% margin, that's another 50 billion. So you, in, in 24 months, you got 100 billion net income on a company right now, so it's trading 8X net income of 24 months out. That's where the growth is, right? The street is not predicting, forget about FSP. None of them have potential for 100 billion net income on 5 million cars and 300 gigawatt hours of energy store. And this excludes supercharging and energy services. If you factor in some of those capacities at about a cent per kilowatt hour, because that's generally what, that's like a super discounted rate. And you think about it as far as super mile, supercharger miles charged, and energy transferred from energy services, that number alone, which I'm not including, is 100% free cash flow. Uh, and it's in zero models, and you can model that, and especially with the network now being open to other vehicle brands. Like, There's a lot of upside from the quote-unquote metal and the metal-related services outside of FSD. Thank you. Gary, did you want to respond to that? And then we'll bring up other speakers as well. No, I don't know if there was a question there. I'll just want to say, I respect what JP said there, but I just don't see that kind of net income being generated over the next year or two. I mean, what what I'm trying to get out of it, and I, and Gary did a great point of asking, I just don't know, like, if I was making a portfolio, there's something, you know, Buffett always talks margin of safety. Like, if you want margin of safety, go buy, you know, Google, Meta, I get all that. But when you're investing in Tesla, Tesla is a bit of a story stock. I don't think that for the degree of difficulty to get to 5 million units, 10 million units, and when you have a gregarious CEO, a very eccentric CEO like Elon, a genius, there's so many things that are kind of moving. Your margin of safety is kind of hard. So when you just do a numbers-based calculation and try to say, okay, here's the units, here's where I think the margins are be, here's the TAM, I think you lose what Tesla is about as a stock. I think you have to have some type of imagination. If you don't put numbers to it, that's fine. But you saw how Tesla stock moved from low hundreds to almost 300 as fast as it dropped to 100 once they realized, okay, people are going to use the infrastructure network. Even though it wasn't going to be a money generator, you saw investors pile in. Like if there was a licensing deal, you would see investors pile in. Tesla is not one of these stocks where you just say, here's the number, here's what I think the EPS, the net income will be in a couple of years, and let me throw some multiple and I get some valuation. No, it's about that future. It is about the idea of a working robot that you talked about, Tam, Gary. It's the biggest TAM in the world. Uh, you, you don't have to know exactly what the TAM is, how many units. What you have to know is a bot is labor. Labor is essentially, to take a quote from Elon, quasi-infinite. So you, you pick it out all around the world. Who doesn't need a robot to just do some simple task? A robot to maybe be a security guard? A robot to – I mean I'm just coming up with some things Show off the top of my head. Do. The Show value to do. society though it will be a value of the equity, right? Like – People value equity to, to what they do, not only just in numbers, to what it does for the world, what it does for standard of living. So if you can get a functional robot, now your debate could be, I don't think they can get a functional robot anytime soon or ever, so I'm not going to sign any value. But if you do believe in two, three, four years, Tesla will have a working robot that could work at a factory, that could be a security guard, and you could just do this simple thing in your head, then I think you could assign, you know, some type of value on that. And I think if you don't, I think it's so hard to stretch these numbers to get to multi-trillion dollar valuations on Tesla from a car business alone. When they've told, when we see the margins compressing, when we see net income year over year going down, when he, they told us the energy business, the margins weren't going to be that great. This is what management has told us. So when you're going against what management's telling you and not going against 
with the stories they are telling you about, you know, FSD in the future, Tesla bot in the future, I just think your margin of safety gets evaporated. I agree with that. And that's why I don't do that. I don't stretch my numbers to get to some number. I try to figure out exactly what is going to happen in real life. And I'm not trying to stretch my numbers to get to some, you know, make believe target, you know, whether it be $800 or $1,000 to do that. I don't do that. I, my problem is when I look at a lot of these forecasts about bots and robots, there's no numbers in there for competition. It's just Tesla's the only one who can do it. And I just don't buy that. And there's a lot of robots that work on factories today. Yeah. Um, I think it doesn't, it's going to be a long time. Sorry, Gary. Go ahead. Why? Why can't there be other robots? There's robots. Well, let me just jump in, Herbert. Gary, I respect you, but but to be honest, come on. Christian. Wait, Herbert, this is important. Boston Dynamics has been working on a robot for 20 years, and the best they can do is it, it does a little dance, and it needs to be programmed. Elon is is making a bot. Like, like we all know this. Like, he's making a functional wait, bot to be useful, to be why useful in the wait? world, to do chores, not to do dances. Guys, so there is no one else doing this, do. Gary. Why can't you wait and see what it does and then evaluate? That's the way you would do yes. if there was a new drug. Can you imagine if Merck said, hey, we're going to have a drug that cures cancer, but you can't produce a prototype. Show me what but it can Gary, do. But Gary, there is value Amazon. being assigned. What company, tell me what other company besides Boston Dynamics doing some pre-programmed yeah. dance that they tried so, 30 times and they finally hit it. What other company in the world there's, can there's do many. what Tesla just put out a few days ago, Tesla bot doing? What other company can do that? Okay. They, what they put out a few days ago is anything that's, that's I mean, the thing was playing. What other company has a, a robot <laughs> hardware and has that knowledge but, no but one Christian, if you're that right, bullish well. then you should be thinking the market cap's eight trillion not worrying about it's two right you can't no i do i believe in tw- no, what i'm saying is you got to produce exactly. a model you can't just throw that out there conceptually and say it's well we're just having a chat so I, I mean i don't have the whole like a model okay. here for can, you, can you I, i'm second, giving please? you a reason oh, to get Christian. bullish on the stock other than just cars. Bullish. Yeah, you but you're bullish only on the position. car business. And I think to get to the numbers you're talking about is going to be so difficult when margins are getting compressed. They're not growing. Units are going down. Like, there's a lot of Tesla bulls that thought they would do way more than 2 million cars um, this year. They thought when? 3 million, 4 million. Okay, we have a okay. tax credit, well, that's a, a literal problem. tax that's credit, and we still problem. can't get to Elon's target of 1.8 million we had to reduce price dramatically to barely get to his base case of 1.8 his stretch case was two he could barely get to 1.8 with dramatic price cuts gary but that's my point christian people are too exuberant and i don't like being exuberant like everybody else to me i want to be realistic and that's exactly my numbers have not changed that much this year i'm still kind of where i was so I don't, I don't like being exuberant, and I don't want to be making up numbers for their other businesses. If they could show a robot that can, as you say, can replace a factory, or replace a landscaper, replace a crossing guard, and if you could show me you can actually do that, then I can build it in. But I can't just, like, pretend that it's going to work and, and then build a number up based off of it. I have to see something that actually works. I'm going to interrupt here because, okay, so first of all, we're talking about the bots, and I think Gary – you know, you need to look at, and you, Christian, more closely with all the competitors out there. Uh, Scott Walter and I have done at least 12 videos on looking at 15 different bots that are out there. They are out there. The market for bots is so large, you can have every one of them be very, very successful for many years from now before they're going to have to compete against each other and compete for market share. Number one. Two, you do need to look very closely at these bots. Because there's three things you need to look at, right? Mobility, the ability for it to move, its hand dexterity, and its intelligence. And the ability to do the hand dexterity instead of just pinchers, there's lots of market for people, for bots that just do pinchers. You know, pick and place and move, already that will succeed. So there will be many bots that can do that. Digit is one example. They already created the first uh, World Wide Robot Factory announced in in Oregon. Of course, these guys have never built a factory before. They've never built bots in massive production, and they don't have any brains. But these things will be able to sell. The difference between the humanoid robot that Optimus is going to be is that it has all three of them. And so far, there's no other company that has all three, right? You need to have the brains. And the brains, as we talked about, is what you are building with the three supercomputers that Tesla has. And, and we can keep going on and on about how different that is than other bots that are able to do this. Now, many competitors. So 
just it's it when you watch these bots that is your prototype gary and you're watching hey, it do these movements i hear yes. you but i've heard the same thing for four years about fsd no no yeah wait, don't wait, stop wait, don't wait, look wait. backwards the, don't look the, sir gary the, I'm interrupt the you. only one that has don't the don't do that skills the data and the compute and yet gary, they're nowhere ahead of everybody gary, else you can't do that Think you can't be that. going back and going look what happened in the past therefore this is what's going to happen in the future you've got to look at today they have three okay. massive supercomputers today they have now this new model of end-to-end uh, -end training. They now have a bot that's in place today. So you can't. You got to look at today okay. and onward. Robert, I hope you're right. Okay, I'm just not willing to count it. Just like I wasn't willing to count FSD four years ago when Elon was saying it's going to drive itself because they have the engineers, they have the data, and they have the compute. That's what he was saying four years ago. He's still not ahead of everybody else. So. I just can't be building a number based on the promise, the aspiration that it's going to happen. Maybe it will, and I hope you're right, because then yeah, our position the, will pay off. Well, the other point here is that if you've read the book, his biography, you can see that his own developers uh, were obviously f telling him that he's making yeah. statements. That is not what's happening today. His own developers, all of them, many of them are now telling you that FSD 12 and end to end, and you're actually physically seeing it in practice with the bot. Anyways, okay, you don't have to take my word for it. You can wait a little bit more until you get proof, but the point yeah. is stay, be, be a little bit closer. Look a little closer and do not be blinded by what happened in the last five years for you to decide what might actually start happening sooner than you realize. So that, that's it. That's it's a boo to me, Herbert, that four years ago, I had the Uber Bulls tell me, I didn't understand technology, maybe I don't, and I was behind the curve on this, but I was right about FSD in terms of timing, and I was right about where they would be on RoboTaxi. Others were wrong who, who had a lot more technical knowledge than I had. And all I'm saying is people said the same thing to me four years ago about FSD. That's all I'm saying. Okay, do you, do you know what happened with... Okay, let's move on. I mean, people who okay. predict things in the future, they're often wrong in the short term. They say it's going to happen in two to three years and it doesn't happen. But the people who say it's going to happen 10 years from now, they're shocked that it happens in the fourth and fifth year. So that's what I'm just saying to you. Now that we've already at the fifth year, you've been correct, doesn't mean it's going to take another five to 10 years to get there. It could be happening sooner as we see exponential curve happen of these technologies. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just mean, for both bulls. Yeah, no, I just... I think to really summarize that conversation is if you wait till it's here, you're going to miss all the alpha. Like if it's here, then like everybody knows about it. So I don't know how you get beyond it's got to be here for me to count it versus, you know, missing all the alpha. I mean, I think there'd be one question. But I already own the stock. I mean, I already own it. If I was not owning it, then you could yell at me, but I already own it. And it's their second largest position. And I told oh, you yeah. that the reason it's not number one is because the pricing risk. Look, I watched the stock go from 300 to 100 in the fourth quarter. It was down 55%. NASDAQ was flat, okay? That, you, you can't have that happen again, even if FSD and bots are going to be a big deal. So you're not going to make me any more bullish unless you get me convinced that he's not going to take prices down. That's the risk to the stock. I thought I did that earlier with the Model 3 and the Model Y. Where we I hope, I well, hope let me ask right. you, Kerry, what, what exactly could Tesla do that we could ever actually convince you that they will not bring prices down anymore? And they've already announced that they're always going to do price advice maneuvering depending on local you know, and situations. I'm okay, that that. I'm okay with them pricing, and you see it with the inventories. So it's the difference between a configurator price cut and an inventory price cut. If they keep cutting inventories because their production gets ahead, of their orders, that's fine because it's a, when you're building a model, you're building it into one quarter of margin hit, but you're not building it forever. When you take configurator prices down, unless you're aggressively pushing them back up, it forever changes the valuation because, you know, like when you take Model S and X down by 15%, that goes into your model for third quarter and fourth quarter and 2024 and, 20, and all the way out. Okay. So if I could be convinced that they were getting more disciplined about pricing, and rather than just cut price every time their production gets ahead of, of their orders, then I could be more optimistic. But I think we're pretty bullish. I mean, the bears think I'm, I'm like the Uber bull out there. Can I ask you a question, Gary? Is it about what prices they reduce? Because you always get back to that argument. It shouldn't be in the configurator. It should be just for whatever inventory they have. Or is it about margin? And if it is about margin, how low could EBITDA margin go for you to still stay convinced about your investment? Well, it's about dis discounted cash flow and it's about, you know, future present value. So 
if it's just a one quarter phenomena that they somehow got, you know, the, the quarter wrong and they produced too much relative to their orders, they can discount inventory. So when I build a model, I don't just say, okay, because they're discounting this quarter, therefore they have to discount next quarter. I just assume that this quarter is it. And then next quarter, I go back to my configurator price and I start all over until if it looks like they're going to have to discount again, I'll build it into the next quarter. So far, we've had a couple quarters in a row where you've had to build it because their margins have been down all year. But EPS for this year, somebody brought it before, is down 38% from where it started the year. Think about that. The 2023 numbers are 330. I think Jeff brought it up. You know, they started the year then higher because they keep discounting the inventory. But, you know, hopefully they'll get to a point, and I think they're getting there where they learn their lesson and they say, you know what? Taking prices down doesn't get us that much volume, so therefore we shouldn't be doing that anymore. I'm hopeful that they learn that. And going forward, what we've seen is, so with the Model Y rear-wheel drive, 0 to 60 in 6.6 seconds, it's a lower price product. That shouldn't affect their margins because people are still going to be buying a Model Y long range and a Model Y performance. Model 3, same thing. So I feel optimistic that they've learned their lesson. The cutting price doesn't really get them much. They really haven't gotten much by cutting price this year. But I'm hopeful they've learned their lesson because if they take prices down tomorrow on Model Y by 15 or 20 percent, stock's going down 20 percent, just like it did in fourth quarter, right? Because they started discounting in China. And you could tell they were going to do that in the U.S. That's why the stock got absolutely hammered in the fourth quarter. I, don't, I, I can't take that much of a, a drawdown again. I, I fucked up by not taking Tesla out of the portfolio last fourth quarter. I should have, but I didn't. And I should have got back in when it looked like they were going to stop doing that, which was, you know, I guess, second quarter. So do you feel today comfortable around 250 or are you in a position where you're actually, you know, worried on looking out of more negative sentiment to get no, out of the stock? It wouldn't be our number two position if I didn't believe what I'm saying here, that I think by seeing a rear wheel drive Model Y, which is the same thing they have on Model 3, and by saying that the new Model 3, they're going to take prices up, that shows pricing discipline. The fact they did cut price on Model Y, right, in the third quarter, but they still missed numbers, that's positive for me because that showed they had pricing discipline. If, if all of a sudden I see them start taking configurator prices down on Model Y rather than just inventory discounts, that would scare me. So right now, I feel pretty good about upside, downside. I see upside at about 320. I see downside at, you know, let's call it 220. That's a good upside downside. I can keep it as my number two position at about 8% position. But I just don't want to see any more just random, called idiotic price cuts because he doesn't know what else to do. Why not try educating people about why they should buy a Tesla? To me, that just is so much cheaper than cutting prices. But he, he won't try it. You know, and I, don't, I don't understand like why he can't just say, you know, look, rather than cut prices by 15%, 20%, Let's try educating people on why they should buy a Tesla instead of a Ford Mach-E or instead of a, you know, an, an ice car. I don't know why he can't try it. That's what scares me. That's, it's a very unsophisticated marketing organization. Let's okay. Let's, let's have Dale come on up. But I think advertising is absolutely coming under play. And now that they have lowered price to be cheaper than ice, it's perfect timing for that. Go ahead, Dale. Hey, thanks for having me up. I really appreciate it. Gary, I really enjoyed your your drive with Omar. I thought that was just, it was uh, fantastic. I super enjoyed it. So here's my question, Gary, for you. So FSD milestones, do you have milestones in mind that you need to see them achieve where it would affect your model and change things? So for instance, would a milestone be you go with Omar with version 12 in January mm. and you're on a drive it makes no mistakes in five hours and you're getting reports in from, you know, YouTube and everywhere else saying this thing is not making mistakes. How does that change your model and what milestones are in there that'll actually facilitate change? Yeah, well, that's look, that's very episodic, meaning that's an overfitted area. He drives in probably the most overfitted area in the country because everybody lives in Palo Alto and you know, where we were driving is, is just, you know, it's a very well-traveled route. What I would like to do is see that it works in other parts of the country. It works in Chicago, which, you know, FSD is not great here. And I've driven with people here and it's just, it, it's, you know, it has issues. I would like to see Tesla assume liability and say, if it screws up, you know, it's not, 
it's the car's fault. It's not the driver's fault. And, you know, I tried to quiz Martin on that when I met him, and I just don't hear that they're anywhere close to that. And maybe they're not. And to me, if they would assume the liability, I would feel much more that they're close to being level four, level five. But they don't seem, maybe they're waiting until they get there. And then they'll assume level, you know, they'll, they'll assume legal liability if the car screws up. But right now they're still putting it on the driver if it screws up. So the funny thing actually is that when they assume legal liability for you, that's a plus. While I fear when they assume legal liability, the market will punish them thinking, my gosh, now they have so much liability. Not if it works. Not if it works. Because then you assume that they believe, look, they know more about FSD than anybody. And if they could see that it works 99.9% .9 of the time, that to me would be when they would assume legal liability, if it works. But to the fact that they haven't assumed it, which means they're keeping it at level two, means they don't have confidence that it works 99.9% .9 of the time. Maybe, or maybe they just don't want so many people on FSD until it gets to be 99.9% .9 of the time. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why they're so slow to accept legal liability unless they don't have the confidence that it's there yet. I don't know. I don't know the answer. But they obviously don't have conviction yet because it's such a marketing tool if you say this is now level four and it'll work 99.9% .9 of the time. I would think that would sell more FSD packages. Don't you? Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you because then obviously that will take the insurance off any other cost, right? It's just not worth it. Yeah, I, just... I don't think it's worth the liability though. With the $12,000 per car, you know, if there's an accident, I get it. It would incite trust, but like, you know, talk about upside downside. Why would you want to assume liability for four? Because that's the only way you can get a robo tax. License. You can't get it unless you're willing to assume the liability. These things will happen at the right yeah. moment when they're ready, then it turns on and they'll be able to accomplish it. But I, I think there's such a long way before you get regulatory approval. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of other ways that Tesla is going to make money through FSD once they've shown that it actually works even before you get regulatory approval, before you assume liability. So, so Herbert, what do you think it is? How do you define that it works? Is it 99%? Is it 95%? Well, the, I'm going to use the words that Elon uses, which is how much safer is it than a human? Currently, probably we're two times safer. He has said that he believes hardware forward. That's all it Well, is. there are statistics, I guess, and they've got enough billions of miles at their drive. They actually can tell you today that autopilot is already so much safe. I don't, you know, they, I think, I don't know if they've actually announced exactly how much safer it is in human on the highways, but on the streets, they, I think they've heard, I've heard them say two times, and then eventually they want to get to six times safer if, with Harbor 4, and I think that Harbor 3, I think he said, is maybe only three to four times, and then once they get to two times safer, they're going to work towards four times, six times, and eight times, and ten times safer than a human. That's what he has said. He just recently tweeted that out literally just three weeks ago. We're not there yet. But FSD 12 is the promise that, again, if you've watched the video from Ash uh, Adaswamy and showing what this can do, how it's teaching itself, that is now going to be, it's what's being used to address all these edge cases. And the way I look at it is if it is able to do one or two or three of these edge cases, which they've proven, it's now what they've said. Again, listen to what they're saying, right? It's no longer coding constraint which means humans and developers hired, it's now compute constraint, which is they, they know that this system end-to-end -end, can learn anything on its own if you throw enough miles at it of video. And so at this point, the confidence level is very high that you're going to get to the 99.99. We are not there. It might take several years, but the confidence level is very high at this point. And but it can also happen very quickly, Gary. This uh, version 12 is going to be rolled out. Uh, they're, I think all, they're all thinking it might roll out to our consumers' hands by the end of this year. Uh, might take longer, but they're building out. They've now got three supercomputers, Gary. So by <laughs> next year, they're going to have not only the largest supercomputer in the world, it's going to be 20 times larger than the current uh, capacity today. So, you know... You can't tell me I'm not going to value the company with any AI at all until they have revenue when they've got going to be the three largest supercomputers in the world in their hands by within a year. How much is your very bullish outlook based on what management says as opposed to what experts say? Meaning, as an analyst, you learn not to listen to management because management, you know, 
it's not that they exaggerate, but they're paid to be bullish. Elon's paid to be bullish. He's a CEO. Yeah. I was a CEO. You're paid to be bullish. How much of your bull case yeah. is based on what experts tell you as opposed to what management tells you? My them? entire day-to-day -day life for the last year has been interviewing experts on my channel. And I do... I ask people, you know, the robot experts, people who've been co-founder robot experts, and let's dive deep and let's really understand this bot and let's find out what they're doing. Let's dive deep into what AI is. What does it mean when, you know, let's break down what Ashok Alaswamy's video is. Wait a minute, Ashok these... is from Tesla. I'm saying outside of Tesla people. Well, you of course. You can't rely on them. Yeah, no. The management, well, that's part of management. I'm talking about outside of Tesla. Yeah, but Ashok, of course, presented something and you can only evaluate what you see because there's also, and I can push it back to you, there's probably things they have not shown you that they're capable of that they haven't shown to folks. So, yes, I get to what you're saying. I mean, clearly, when you read the book on Elon, he has made statements that are not based on reality. He has his, you that's know, Tesla reality distortion field. Herbert. You can't, that, you, you've got to lie to Tesla management. Agreed with you. There well, I think true. you answered the question, Herbert. You are doing that, and just to get, just to tag on really quickly on on FSD. Back to Dale's point on these milestones, I think you have to be looking at the size of compute, and you have to be looking at miles driven because these other companies aren't going to magically get there without going through those two, without going through those two points. And I think those are things that analysts can externally get research on and get data on and, and, and have an objective view of like, well, what's the state of real world FSD and real world driving? I think that's one thing. The other the third point is these other people that are driving in these limited, you know, pre-map subsets, they're all burning cash. They're all negative gross margin. They're all losing money at this point. So I don't see, I, I, I struggle to understand their path to not only profitability, but their path to like this being a 70 or 80% type SaaS business, which is what Tesla is out to build. And I agree today that neither of them work today. Like they, they work. Right. I understand right. that. But if you look at, you have to, I just want to dissect the point, the milestones are the compute and the miles. And to say that these people are going to get there without the computer, without the miles it really strains credulity, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, and real quick, it's a great conversation. I just want to say real quick, like, like, let's take someone like Ron Barron. Ron Barron has been around the business, very successful guy. He's invested in Tesla. He talks about mobility eventually. He talks about Dojo. So as an investor, Gary, and I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying you're an analyst. You're, you're a very good analyst. You've got your numbers, but you're also an investor. Investors have to look at the future, and if you don't, like try to like come up with some type of scenario that, okay, if this happens, I don't need an exact number, but man, that's going to be worth a lot. I need to own the stock. And maybe you do that. You're just not putting numbers to it, but not only you're an analyst, you're also an investor. So I think that's what we're talking about it. We're talking from more of an investment look at it rather than just, I need some numbers to get evaluation. I think an investor can look at these other things and with some reasonable evidence, which I think Herbert just said very eloquently that Christian, we're portfolio managers. We own it. It's our second largest position. We're the same thing as Ron. We're just not willing to be wowed by management's promises. We have to see proof. That's the difference. Okay. So it's our second largest position. We own the stock. I own the stock personally. So it's not just being analytical about it. I just, as an analyst, I was trained, don't trust management. Don't listen to what management says. Verify outside of what management says. And unfortunately, a lot of retail investors just, they say, well, Elon says this and management says, I don't care what Elon says. I don't care what management says. It's just, that's not how we do research. You got to get outside. Yeah. Of yeah. I agree with you. I'll just, I'll just end it on this. So I agree with you a hundred percent, but I think what my broader point is when you're an investor and you're, like you said, you're an investor again, I'm not going back and forth with, you. I'm just saying like, you have to also believe in management, right? Like if you just say, well, I'm going to discount everything they say, that's also not a great investor because when you're investing in a company, you should have some type of faith that management will produce what they say. And I think that's what Ron Barron does. He believes that Elon will get the done. That's why he has a, a maximum position. He'll never sell a share. So I think part of investing, and I'm not saying I'm the greatest at that. I'm more of a, you know, I trade it a lot, but I'm saying pure investing, if you're like a long buy and hold, like, like a wrong baron or a regular investor, I think it's not out of the ordinary. I think you would be doing a malservice if you don't look at bot and try to incorporate some type of 
valuation on that or FE, you know, with mobility. I think that's part of the story. So uh, I love the conversation, though. Again, this is not an attack. It's just a, a nice chat. It's fair. It's fair. Fair point. All right. Let's, do we need a breather here? I got to hop in eight minutes. Guys. Can I, can okay. I ask you a question? Gary, before you go, keep it short. And I yeah. just, I think to put a bow on the FST thing, cause I think why you have Gary here and you know, we don't, we, we, this tends to happen a lot. And I think all I want to say this, I think the FST will happen. I think robot actually will happen. And Herbert, you're right to point out when it happens. I'm not nearly as bullish in the near term. I do think that the best way for them to monetize it, I personally believe we're going to see about a hundred billion dollar deal with the DOD to license the technology and dojo for use you know, mm. that, I think that's the least liability with the most up- upside and validation of the technology. The object recognition alone, everything you said, Herbert, that's what makes it worth it to be used. They can even par- pair it with the, the satellite starship, star shield deal. Like they're already having those conversations. The, the procurement teams already know each other. Like there's, I think that's the least path of resistance for monetization near term. Now, bring it back to what's tangible today for an auto company and an energy company. Gary, I'm going to bring this up with Rivian as a base case. Rivian beat in their revenue expectations last quarter because of the switch to LFP batteries. They got rid of the expensive nickel batteries. Tesla, and I'm very, I've been early. I don't think I'm wrong. Tesla is in the transition by partnering with Cattle and all of, and management has made this assertion their suppliers have made this assertion and verified it in their earnings and their deliveries. Tesla is their number one customer for LFP and the new M3P battery technology. And I think that a lot gets put on the prices of Tesla and we don't do as much analysis in the cost. Now, I agree with you, you can't trust management, but I, you can trust the suppliers who also do public reporting. What needs to happen from uh, a street perspective for people to understand that the margins from the, the battery costs and the new production efficiencies, right, need to have been going down at a rate that's commensurate with sort of maybe the price adjustments and that maybe the price adjustments don't matter relative to where they're going on the production side. So the second part of that question is, I think if you take a conservative view of unit production capacity today, I think that realistically, at one point, you know, you could say in the low side, 1.25 million Shanghai, 750, 800,000 Fremont, 500,000 Berlin, 500,000 Austin, right? So you have 3 million cars. Forget the 10 million or 20 million. Where do you, what year do you get to 5 million cars? And if I'm right on the battery supply side and Tesla is half right on what their cost efficiencies are going to be on the production side where they Baglino said that they're going to see a 20 I think it was a 24% reduction in cost from 19 to 2022 in their forward operating model. How do you put that into your model going out as far as adjustments on the efficiencies for, for the gross margins? Look, first question, it's really hard because Tesla doesn't give you any of those cost side information, not even on a like a once a year basis. If we could like track them instead of what you're saying, which is piece them together from suppliers then we could all kind of keep track of it. And then, you know, once a year, at least true it up in our models. But since they don't give it out, they just give you revenue and they give you profit and then everything else is in the middle. It's in cost because they don't give any cost components out. You're kind of left to doing what you're doing, which is say, okay, let's make up some numbers to figure out what the different pieces are in terms of labor costs, what the materials costs and what the overhead costs are. I don't know how to model because Tesla's never even given them out, even in like an annual report. So you're just throwing numbers well, up there and hoping that you're right. And then once a year, I can't true well, it up. Well, to be fair, Gary, so I'm not, I'm not trying think. to make up all the numbers. I'm trying to hone in on one component. So if I know how much they, like, we know for a fact they're buying battery cells. You can 100% figure out exactly what Cadell sells the battery cell for. They report. I understand it, but I don't have anything in Tesla that shows the raw material part of COGS. If you think of COGS as, Raw materials, there's labor, and there's overhead. I can't even tie out any one of yeah. those things. Where with other companies, I can. Yeah. I agree. I, I think I just can't get yeah. there. There's nothing. There's nothing for me to tie to. I don't disagree with you. I wish they were more granular with. It. I would just. Then they have models that go in circles that just go on forever, but there's never any proof statements that I can tie it back to anything. That's the problem. Yeah, if, well, and that's why we. That's why people don't do it. That's why they don't do yeah. it. Well, 
I think Let's you proxy yep. and their outperformance with their on their costs reducing so their move to profitability right is going up as the units go up, but also their unit economics get better. I think that's something maybe if you have time or your team to look at because I think with their smaller number of units, it's easier to see how yeah. pronounced the cost savings are there. Yeah. Questions being asked on the calls, Gary, if they were to break down supplier cogs deflation and they were to break it out factory conversion and start like consistently on these calls because there's an expectation in the auto industry of being able to take down one to one and a half percent supplier inbound material cogs per quarter. Like yeah. that's a minimum baseline expectation. If they start getting these questions repeatedly and they and it's broken down in a methodical way, maybe we can start getting better info from them. Yeah. I don't as you know, I don't get a chance to ask the question because I'm not on the sell side, but you're right. I wish somebody would ask those questions and I wish Tesla would just, you know, once a year they could give out those pieces and then we could always tie back. Other companies do that. Tesla won't do it. I don't know why. And when do you think you get when do you get to five million cars, Gary? Let's see. What do I have in my model? I get the five main cars in. I get there in 2026. And you, what's your ASP like? You, I so you said the cyber trucks only getting you into like the mid high 40s. You don't think that it's it could push I'm into 50s? I'm at 45 for this year in 2026. I get to 47 two and cyber truck. I have in 2026. I have 600 thousand units a year. And that, I assume, a 60,000 ASP. The problem is it's the model, what I call the model two. I have that in my 5 million units. I have that 1.2 million units in 2026. And I have an average selling price of 30 on that. So it drags down my ASP because it's a bigger percentage of the mix. Now, if I'm wrong and Cybertruck is, say, a million two, then you can, you know, you can get a higher ASP. But because I have the compact driving volumes after about, like I have Model Y in 2026 is 2.1 million units. But by, you know, 2030, I've got the Model 2 at three and a half million units. But why, why do you so, think that the CUV, like if, if the CUV is the number one segment in all OEMs today, why would that not be the majority? Like I have, the Model Y and the Cybertruck being the two biggest units in my model as it moves further out. How do, why do you have the Y shrinking so much? Because it's priced to $50,000 and that's not the most of the TAM. Most of the TAM is under, you know, $30,000. And if you're going to really get a lot of units, you've got it. You got to go after that business. That's why I've always been a big fan of them with the Model 2 because that's where the, still the lion's share of the TAM still is. It's under $30,000. I, I, so, yeah. If I can just I agree with you, I would say <laughs> if you were to comp it to GM, GM's number one cars, number one and two cars sold is the pickup trucks, so whatever, the Silverado. Yeah, yeah. And then the yeah. number two is actually the Chevy Equinox, their CUV. And it's actually really close. GM's average. But Toyota is Corolla and RAV4. Yeah. And the, which are under 30,000 bucks. Well, yes and no. The RAV4s, they actually sell for more, and it's a lot of leases. But I, I would just say the reason why I'm com- comping to GM for, as an example, and I think they're a horribly managed company, but GM's average unit price is about $52,000 today. And they were doing, mm-hmm. and even it was last year, and, before, and they're doing about five and a half million. I agree with you on volume. If, if Tesla's going to get to 10 and 20 million, I think the ASP is lower, definitely lower. I, five and a half million in, or five million in 110 million SAR, that's not real volume. That's a good number. But to me, I don't think we're talking about like mass killing cars that need to be super low priced to get there. I feel fairly confident that without them, I, I have five and a half million without the Model 2, because I think it's actually going to be slower to get to big numbers with that. I think that we're going to see a 400 mile three and a 400 plus mile Y in the next 12 months or less. And I think the cyber truck and the S and the X, like, I think the cyber truck is going to be a bigger unit than we realize going forward. And like, once they hit the road, I think like if we have 2 million pre-orders, you can discount it by half, but once they're on the road, you can easily see another million or plus coming in relatively quickly. And that's just thinking domestic. Look, look at, 
I have to go, but I have this debate yeah. every day with the Bears, and every day, you know, the Bears will say, "Why do you think Cybertruck is going to be even six hundred thousand units?" I said, "This is reminiscent." I had this discussion today with somebody of Model Y when Model Y came out. What was it in twenty? The Bears all said it's a big, ugly Model Three. Nobody, if, if people buy it, it's just going to cannibalize Model Three, and they were wrong. It actually substantially increased the TAM because, to your point. You went into the CUV segment, which was the largest segment, was the fastest growing segment. I think pickups is going to do the exact same thing. You're going to get a whole new set of cars, totally incremental, right? So I agree with you that cyber trucks will be huge. I just, I'm not smart enough to know what the mix is going to be by 2026. I just think you're going to get to five million, but that would be a good problem to have to get to five million by 2026 because the street is nowhere near there. The street is like it, I don't know, three or something by 2026. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Gary. We really appreciate this. This was a wonderful space. You've been very um, kind with your time. Follow him on, check out his website at The Future Fund. Check him out. Thank you, Gary. We'll do this again the next time. Thank you for the speakers. JP, invest in others. his funds. Invest that, in his funds. Invest in his funds. Wait. FFND okay. and FFLS. Invest in Tesla. All right. Uh, follow the speakers and thank you guys. Visit us again next week on every Tuesday. We have a space like this, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time. And then on Fridays, we drop a, a YouTube show every Friday as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.